Good evening and welcome to another episode of A Politically Incorrect Guyana. My name is Kian Jabour and as usual, not always, but as usual, I am your host this evening. I'm sorry I've been away for two uh, weeks now. My apologies. Um, but it's been an in and out couple of weeks. Uh, what I did get to do is I had a very lovely Easter, um, which I spent in Lethem and over in Brazil in Bovista and more or less just in Rupununi country, um, getting a chance to explore. I will be honest, it's somewhere I do frequent. Um, I am an outdoors type person, so I'm always on the trail, always up and down. So um, got a chance to go to my happy place, if you will. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I hope everybody else had a fantastic Easter. Um, it was very relaxing and very long because the weekend before that was Pagua. So we only had a really a three-day work week. And I don't know about everyone else, but I felt very, very unproductive. So I'm not going to lie. I'm slightly happy to be back um, kind of in my regular programming, kind of on my schedule. It brings a little bit of comfort. But nonetheless, still dealing with... Um, Still dealing with post-vacation, you know, blues. Um, other than that, um, I have to make mention to something that I think I want to say at the beginning of the show rather than the end. Um, I met some really lovely people that are in Guyana doing some really cool stuff. And that is the family of the Suarez Circus that is in town. And it really is an amazing um, show. I got a chance to watch it uh, a couple of days ago. Um, and I really encourage everyone to go and check it out. It is fun. It's great for the kids. They really are, you know, fantastic at putting on a very entertaining show. Um, and it's for everyone. So whether, you know, you're looking for a date night or whether the kids need something to do because we know we're back to school on, on, on um, Monday. But uh, I think it's running for another month or so. Um, so I encourage everyone to go and check it out. It's really fun and there's lots of cotton candy and popcorn <laughs> and the clowns are hilarious and everyone is very talented. So please go and check out the Suarez Brothers Circus showing every day. All right. With that being said, we are going to jump straight into some exciting stuff. Um, let me first be very thankful. I, I, first of all, I think it's important before I start to talk about all the problems that we're having. I think it's important that I need to thank the government for not giving us blackout right this second so I can do this show. Thank you for giving us electricity right at this moment. I'm not going to thank you for earlier today. I'm, is that, I hope it's this television. I know you guys aren't seeing it, but it keeps cutting off here. And I'm getting a little worried that blackout is creeping up on us here. But I'm not going to thank you for earlier today, nor am I sure I'm going to have to thank you for later this evening. It's ridiculous now. I mean, I'm going to ask um, the operator to please bring up... Um, the uh, the graphic that I showed from 2003, in which the government um, in December 2023 said that they are bringing in new generators that they're spending millions of US dollars on that are going to solve our problems. Here we go. I'll read it for you guys because I know everyone has seen it. It says GPL Inc. on December 13th, 2023. New generators have arrived. Just uh, pinpoint one. New generators have arrived to boost generation capacity in the Demerara Burbies interconnected system. And there's some pictures of some big blue generators in containers and a big ship bringing them. It's really, really fantastic. Okay. It looks beautiful and it has the word new in it. And it's only from December 13, 2023. We are currently. We are currently in April, okay? The beginning of April. So that's like December, January, February, March, April. So less than six months. Let's just say six months. Just So in six months, all those generators that they have brought in have already become useless. Oh, that is some really proactive thinking there. You know, I, I also want to make mention that they did have six months between then and now to realize that we're going to be in this problem again. 
But then you start to wonder, wait a second, are they actually really trying to solve this problem? Like, <laughs> I can't be the only one that thinks that no one wants to solve the, the power problem. This, this has to be a deliberate act now. For you guys out there, any of you challenging me, you guys out there telling me that the government is not doing this purposely? But, it, but six months ago, they knew that there was a problem. They brought in emergency generators, spent a lot more money than they should have. And now six months later, we're back to square one. But why didn't they do anything within these last six months? There's, there's also a projection. There's also a form, I, I had it on shows previously. I, it, I don't have it on, on the clip today, but I had it on like, I had it in December. It would have been in December. I had it in December that showed that they know exactly how much electricity is going to be consumed over the next couple of years. And they showed 21, 22, 23, 24, all the way to 25. And it said by 2023, we are going to run out of capacity. So my question is, if they knew that, they'd fix it, and they fixed it in December. I, I don't understand. The projections are still there. They knew it was going to run out again. So how are we here? So um, I'm going to bring up another clip um, with uh, that the government, it's from newsroom, they said um, that they're blaming up new AFC. I gave away the spoiler. I'm sorry, guys. I'm in a good mood today. But I gave away the, um, I gave away the, it's a spoiler. Let, let, let me show you guys. I like when Instagram can be involved. So um, just a zoom in for you guys. It says right there, newsroom. Okay, that's a government uh, news agency, just so you guys know. APNU AFC responsible for electricity generating shortfall today. I like, I like how they write today at the end of this. So there you have it. Um, clearly right there, um, this article was in the papers, or was in the headlines two days ago. So <laughs> APNU AFC responsible for electricity generating shortfall today. All right, I'm going to point out two things here. Now, firstly, I'd like to point out that um, we've been getting blackouts for long before APNU AFC went into power, okay? I, I'm, I, I like most of you out here. I, 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 I went to school when I was young. I'm, I'm in my 30s now. So as far as I can remember back, let's just go to like my common entrance days. I would have been, what, 12, 13 years old? 11, 12, 13, when I wrote Common Entrance. And, um, you know, like normal people. And um, I remember, and I'm 35 now, and I remember getting, I remember as a kid writing, you know, trying to do my little homework with candlelight. So that had to be like, what, 20 years ago? And I'm pretty sure it was PVP that was in power then. So I don't know who PVP were blaming then. But anyways, let's fast forward to 2020. Um, APNU went into power and blackout, we had blackouts as well. Let me, let me just make that clear. During APNU AFC's stint in government between, between 2015 and 2020, we had blackouts as well. And APNU said it was PPP's fault for the previous 20 years. Okay. <laughs> All right, okay, okay, okay. I see a trend here. All right, fast forward now, 2020. Now, APNU AFC was in power for five years, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. 2015 to 2020 is five years. Now, from 2020 to 2024, which is now, is four years, right? Now, how can you still be blaming APNU if you have been in power for almost the same amount of time that they were? One year? One year different? One year. And this is still APNU fault. Why haven't you fixed it in the last four years is the question. Now, I think it's always important for me to point out the obvious here. And this is the part that I challenge everyone on. We are only 750,000 people, less than a million. We are a village anywhere else in the world. How do we still have electricity problems? Now, silly Kian. So I like to be the one that, you know, uses my Google every now and again. So I'm like, you know what? Are you being unrealistic by asking for a consistent power? <laughs> 
<laughs> like, are you being a little, you know, arrogant? You know, are you just trying to attack the PVP? And I'm like, no, I don't think that asking for consistent electricity is a big ask or a big demand. I think this is, you know, basic, you know, necessities in life, at least at this point. Um, so then I sat down and I went, what are some ways that we could get power that, you know, the rest of the world are using? You know, and I looked around and I went, well, wait a second, Kian, you know, you've driven from Los Angeles to Las Vegas before. And you know what I noticed? I saw myself, there's these huge solar farms, like solar panels until you cannot see them anymore in the desert. Like you can't fathom the amount of solar panels that they have. And you know what they're powering? They're powering a large portion of Las Vegas, probably the brightest city in the world. So then, you know, I kind of jump around a little bit. And I said, well, he and you went to college in Toronto. You grew up there. How do they get their power? Because we didn't get blackouts then. And then I'm like, well, wait a second. There's Niagara Falls. Now, Niagara Falls has been powering New York and Ontario for what? Like 30 years now <laughs> with hydropower. Again, <laughs> okay, that's interesting. So then I brought it a little closer to home. And then I went, okay, well, you know what, Kian, you're in a third world country and look at you know, your demographics, look at where you are in the world. And then I was like, okay, but Suriname, what are they doing? Suriname, about seven, I think from my last you know, little research, I think they're in there between 50 and 70% of Suriname's power is now provided by hydropower as well they built a huge dam they built a huge hydro station and that's powering most of Suriname now so I'm like okay well Suriname is even smaller than us that's weird okay and then and then here is my little other experience because you know Kian likes to travel I went to I was in Bovista last week so I'm like, geez, you know, Bovista is so developed. It's huge. There's like big malls and buildings, beautiful roads. The place is clean. And I'm like, I wasn't robbed once. So, you know, I can only assume. Uh, I was like, geez, there's a lot of development here. You know, nice big parks where children go and play, skate parks and little like restaurants all over the place. I was like, wow, this place is super impressive. Uh, you know, it must be expensive. Kian goes and asks around and says, you know, what do you guys pay for electricity? Only to find out they are also mostly on hydro. And I'm like, Jesus, well, they're only one hour away from Letem. <laughs> like, what's going on here? So, you know, my little brain starts to tick around. And you know what I quickly, like, come to the conclusion of, you know, because I always am in problem solving mode. What if, now hear me out. I like to offer solutions. What if, the government just decide, decides, you know, maybe, maybe it's a good decision to privatize the power companies in places like Letham and New Amsterdam and, you know, Anna Regina and, you know, Bartica and, you know, pr you know, maybe give that business opportunity to start to private companies. You know, that can bring in their investment and, you know, um, they can set like standards where you're only supposed to be able to charge X amount. Because I, again, I like to use my own personal experience. I grew up in, in a part of Canada called Edmonton, which is in Alberta, which is also an oil producing nation. And we have private, um, when I was living there, there, there were private electricity companies that all the households were on. And there were multiple competing companies which you know brought down the comp you know the prices and um gave us very reliable electricity so i was like well wait a second it's working in other parts of the world why are we still state run um uh i i also noticed um recently um for all of you that don't know any gpl uh employees out there i encourage you to go out and ask them but there has been a big hush hush memo uh and meetings that have been ongoing in gpl in which the government, uh, the government has turned to the employees at GPL and said they are cutting overtime because the organization is in a financial crisis. So oil producing nation, state owned company is in a financial crisis and the workers cannot work overtime because they don't have enough money to pay them. Um, I don't know what more you guys want other than I'm starting to hopefully paint the same picture for you guys that I have in my head, which is this is 
seems to be purposeful. Um, I feel like the government is actively giving us these black coats. Um, they, they, anybody with, I, you don't even need to be, a, you know, you don't even need to be a genius at producing electricity uh, or be an electrician or, you know, anything around those matters. But you can figure out that, you know, let's just say you realize that you were doing something wrong. Let's just say, I, I, you know, I wasn't handling or running GPL properly. The question is, why wouldn't I bring in people that are capable of doing it instead of my friends and my family? Instead of the, my, my PPP comrades um, that I have to give jobs to, high-paying jobs at that, um, uh, why not bring in actually capable people to do it? Because clearly what we're seeing is that these people are incompetent. And I lean right back into the fact that this is being done purposely and they want us to get blackouts so that when we don't get blackouts, we're going to praise them. So they create the problem and then they pretend to be the solution. That's interesting. Excuse me, I have a little cold. Um, that was rude of me. But I mean, you guys must see that this is ridiculous now. I, I don't even want to begin. I, I, what I'm really also curious about, and I'm going to go after them a little bit. How come we haven't heard from the private sector commission or like GCCI more? Because I'm a business owner. And I cannot explain to you how much money I am losing. So, for example, I have lots of freezers in my business. You know, when you get blackouts for hours on end, multiple times a day, I'm losing money, right? Because all my, for example, my ice cream is melting. My, my, my food is potentially spoiling. Um, uh, you, you know, little things, I can't store ice. You know, just little things that I have to keep buying now over and over again. Um, uh, let's... Talk about the, oh, I, I have a car wash. There's a car wash in my business right next door. Um, Taco Loco car wash. And every time I get black out, my car wash doesn't, can't operate. I can't tell you how many customers come and sit down and say, oh, we came for a car wash, great. And literally like mid like soaping, <laughs> black out. And I'm like, I don't know what to do here. And now the customer's upset with me, but I'm like, I, I can't control the blackout. So again, money lost. I have to give them a refund. Or sometimes I have to pay for them to go and get a car wash after or give them a free car wash next time they come. So it's it's a little ridiculous. Um, not to mention every, you know, let's sometimes I show football at my restaurant. I got lots of guys that come and watch football, um, Premier League football and Champions League football. They come all the time. And then all of a sudden, you know, watching mid-game, mid-cheer blackout. Well, all these guys then are very upset with me. Get up and leave. <sighs> I'm losing lots of money. So how come the organizations that are, you know, hopefully there to protect businesses or at least the interest of businesses and hopefully small businesses like mine are not saying more? How come they're not like lambasting the government, you know, because GPL is a state company, it's run by the government. How come they're not going after them for all the money that we're losing? So let me get this straight. These guys only talk when, when it's good for the government. These guys are only just there to kiss ass. They're actually not there to protect any businesses, just themselves and hopefully get a contract here and there. That's all these guys are good for. Because other than that, they seem to be very useless because we're still getting black codes. Businesses are suffering and they're not saying anything. So I'm calling them out, okay? I'm calling you guys out. Can you guys please do something other than kiss ass? Please, please, please. Can you please pretend or just just fake it a little bit? You know, maybe maybe write a few headlines to embarrass the government because of the shit job they're doing with electricity. What about all the children that got to write common entrance? Do you care about them? You know, what about the hospitals? What about the people that have medical issues? Do you care about them? Do, 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 do not, so it, it's just that people just don't matter. All that you guys care about is the money in your pockets. All the government can care about is teeth in as much money as possible. Nobody actually don't care about the people of the country. Is that the trend we're seeing? All of you who are running out there, we love the government. We love the PPP. Their progress. Why, why isn't everybody screaming progress now? What happened to the progress shouts? What happened to everybody that's like, we look at the progress. Forget APNU, forget, forget AFC, forget all of them. Look at the progress the PPP is making. What happened to the progress shouts now? Now that people are actually suffering, now that businesses are actually losing money, now that children are actually suffering, well, I don't understand. What happened to the progress shouts? Are you guys just that selfish? Is everybody just that selfish? 
that all they care about you is it let me let me ask a question and i'm asking you all the big businessmen out there that quiet and not say nothing is it that you guys are that fragile or that much in debt or just that scared that 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 you guys just don't say anything unless it has to do with your pocket you guys just don't care about anyone else except for yourselves is that what it is Nobody has anything to say unless they are being affected. But y'all, a couple big businessmen that got generators and think y'all ain't got time with nobody else. The government that taken out that 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 don't even know we experience in blackouts because they are living in government housing. God, the president house don't feel blackout. No, nobody has realized that people are suffering in the country. Is it that, that that's how that's how ridiculous of a society? That's how like like disgusting of a society we become. That we just don't care about anyone else except for ourselves now. And then and then when that little opportunity comes in, we're gonna scream hooray! Because hopefully we get another contract. Don't mind everybody else, man. Y'all keep getting your contracts. Y'all only be concerned about yourselves. Don't stress about it. The rest of us are gonna obviously have to figure it out. Um uh, I want to bring up a um another another interesting article that has been on my mind for a little while and I haven't said too much on it but um, I'll bring it up. It's about uh, I I saw Jagdio. I saw an article come up that uh, the government has decided they're bringing in 500 healthcare workers. Healthcare workers, 500 healthcare workers, and then um, subsequently to that, uh, I saw in one of Jagdio's press conferences he said that don't worry everyone, they're going to be paid the same amount as the local nurses and healthcare workers. <sighs> this is a joke, right? It's a, it has to be an absolute joke. I can ask the operator to bring up the clip and I'm gonna show you guys too. So, so what you're telling me is, come on, I, I, I'm not, I'm, guys, guys, do, I'm not tooting my own horn here, okay? I am not the smartest person in the room. It's a, it's a clip with uh, Jack Dio stating that he's going to be paying all the, uh, the the 500 workers that are coming in the same amount of money as the local health care. Ah, there we go. Let me just show, show, show this up for you guys. There it is. Imported workers will receive same salaries paid to Guyanese. All right. As you can see, politics and health at the top. So he's talking, uh, just so you, just to clarify, he's talking about the, um, the health care, the 500 health care workers. Guys, I'm just going to throw this one out there for all of you. This is creating a problem that is going to end with all of us suffering and then the government pretending that they're solving the problem. So the first question you need to ask is, well, why are 500 healthcare workers coming into the country? Well, that's because all the current nurses and healthcare workers are leaving. It's not because, <laughs> let me just throw this one up. It's not because our population is growing. Nor is it because we demand more health care now, okay? It's coming in because the public health system is over a thousand nurses short. Okay, so when you watch all of these big hospitals being built, I want you to already know that we are a thousand nurses behind. So now you're coming in, you're bringing in these, I think it's Bangladesh or Pakistan or somewhere they're recruiting them from. I, God only knows how that came about. Um, and they're bringing them in to say, look, we're solving the problem. Now everyone has to sit there and say, but wait a second, how did we end up in this problem? Well, that's because you're not paying them properly. You have them working in shit facilities and they have no incentives to grow or, or continue on or work in, a, in a, at least semi-professional manner. So you have now decided that you're going to bring in nurses, pay them the same garbage, leave them in the same garbage conditions, and expect what? For the problem to be solved? No, they're going to leave too, just like all the rest. Okay? You haven't solved the problem here. You've, it's kind of like having a broken leg and then putting a Band-Aid on it. You've not done anything at all. All right? We don't even know... We, you know, if half these nurses going to be qualified because God only knows where they're coming from or, or, or what school trained them. Okay? It's, it's madness. It's, it's utter and complete madness. All right? We've reached the point where nobody cares about anyone. These are people. These are our lives. These are people going into the hospitals and dying. And you guys are doing what? You guys are saying, don't worry, we're bringing in 500 nurses from Pakistan? Why, why are we not bringing in 500 nurses from England? Why are we not bringing in 500 nurses from Canada? 
Why are we not bringing in five engineers from New York? Because I know it's a large American base on there. Why are we, why are we not? We are, we are oil rich Guyana now. We are the largest producers. You tell me why we not paying the big money now. Why people not flooding our shores? How come we got to go out there and look for them? How come our people are not being paid more and treated better? We are big money now. I thought we, look, look at all over the news, all over world news. Now you, there's not this government that just abuse up the, 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 that journalist on BBC. Abuse the man up. It's our time to develop. This is Guyana time. Don't tell us what to do with we money and we oil. But yet the people getting paid garbage and you're bringing in Bangladesh nurses. And we get them black out every single day and the teachers striking and now the public servants about to go on strike too because I just threatened it yesterday. What are we talking about? Is this, is this a joke to everyone? Are you guys literally living in your own worlds? Do you literally not see what's going on with the people of the country? We got three new stinking road, one with a one one with a with a with a with a with a <laughs> One with a carrion crow, one with a jaguar, one with an anteater, and all y'all screaming progress. What is the progress? <laughs> the same road, the same road. I, I watch this every year, and I can call y'all out, and I want everybody to go and look at it. The same road between QC and YMCA. It's Thomas Lanza, I can't remember the name of the road, right? That road, every year consecutively, every single year for the last four years, has been fixed. Every single year that road is broke up. Every single year. It's fixing right now again. <laughs> okay? That's the progress y'all talking to me about. Or it's just a couple of people getting rich. That's what we're talking about. I think we've reached a point where um I think I, I saw in one of the one of the messages, one of the Easter messages, or I can't remember where it was. It was just very recently. I don't I didn't I don't have the clip where uh Airfun was standing up and saying, we need to care more about each other. You every, stop fighting each other down. Hug each other. Care about each other. Don't, no, it's not about me abusing the journalist the other day. You guys, Guyanese, need to care about each other. We need to care about each other. All right. Now, you ask us to care about each other. But yet, you clearly don't care about us. Clearly, the human investment side of this oil money doesn't exist. There's no capacity building in our human capital. There's nobody that's living a more comfortable life now. It's not like education has expanded, you know, the curriculum has evolved, teachers have be become better. They've just been on the road yesterday, last week. Healthcare workers leaving by the droves. Every single private sector person run into the oil industries because they're the only people paying. Children not being educated in schools. Crime rate is through the roof. People are dying on the road. You want to talk about people caring about one another? Talk about how much people dying on the road. Every single day. Y'all remember, I just made the comparison. Y'all remember during COVID time, every time you picked up the newspaper, every single day they had, oh, two deaths today, four deaths today. You remember, and six people in hospital and, and, and four recovered and blah, blah, blah. You remember those statistics they kept giving out? You know those just every single day now. Do you know it's exact same thing for the for the carnage on the roads? Do you know we are losing the same amount of people to deaths on the road as we did with COVID? That's how you care about people. That's how we show that we care. No, no, I don't sit down blaming. And let me tell you, I don't sit down blaming people on the road. I don't sit down blaming the drivers because guess what? They walk in with the system that they have, or better yet, the lack of system that they have. Because guess what? If everybody could drive drunk and not get penalized for it, and everybody could speed, and all them buses could cut through every corner, and all them motorbikes could fly through intersections, and nobody gets penalized because all the police corrupt, and nobody can, and everybody got a big boy friend, they just pick up the phone and say, hey man, tell this police stop harass me, and then the man is along the way. So you tell me how the government is caring. You tell me with the systems that are in place to protect us. The other day I see, what was one of the accidents where the car flying around a corner, hit a pile of sand halfway on the road, flip over, drive on the other, run across the other side of the road and kill people on the other lane? The people that were just dry, driving normally? Like, what are we talking about here? Now, I don't want to stray too far off, but I think it's something that has to be said. And I noticed nobody can say it. All right? 
I'm going to go back to that interview with Irfan Ali and BBC Hard Talk. Okay? We all saw the clip. And Sorry again. And we all celebrated. Everybody said, look at that. You tell him. You, you give him. You, 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 you put him in his place. We need to develop. Now is our time. Our money. Our oil. It's our time to grow. You don't help we. And he's right. He's absolutely right. Okay, absolutely right. The America, Canada, England, China, you know, you name them. Them ain't, France, everybody, them ain't helping we. They ain't got no time with us. All right? And for the last 200 years, they've been developing and growing off of our backs. Okay? Our third world hard working countries. Taking all our resources. Okay? And building their country. And he's right. I have 100% agree with that. We all agree with that. There's no question. I am dead serious. Okay? And he was right with what he said. Him. They, 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 people like England and so on can't talk to nobody. Because they are the one that took advantage of us. All right? Now, I, I, got, I, I hope you all watched the rest of the interview. Because I was very curious to know, you know, what direction BBC was going in. And that clip in particular... Um, he, the, the interviewer said, I can't remember his name. The interviewer, him, interviewer himself said, he said, you're right. You're right that you have the right to develop your country and, 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 and use your resources. But because of what's happening to the planet right now, is what he was alluding to, does that give you the right? Should you use that right? Now, this is a very tricky conversation, okay? Because this is going to go both ways. This is going to go, I, I, you know, you can't tell me what to do. I need to develop my country. But simultaneous to that, we have to understand that we're part of a global community here. We have to understand that we are citizens of the world. All right? Because what I did when I watched that interview is I was lucky enough I was headed into the, into the bush, into the jungle. And you know what I saw? I saw global warming at its worst I personally have ever seen in my 35 years. Okay? I saw our, our, our jungles burning, blazing fire. I saw our rivers as dry as I've ever seen them. I saw drought like I've never seen it before. Okay? I see people leaving their offices daily now just on the East Bank and East Coast because they can't deal with the smoke from the wildfires going on because the place is so dry. Now. Those are farming lands that are burning. Those are fields. Now, I just want to fast forward that for two seconds. That's called global warming. Okay, that, that, That's a shift in our weather patterns because our planet is dying. Something that scientists have been telling us for maybe 50 years now. If you guys continue on this path, the world, you're going to destroy everything. So, we now, as citizens have a responsibility, not just in Guyana, but every citizen in the world has a responsibility to do everything they can to help save this planet, or we're all doomed. And we are now coming to realize that fast forward, let's just fast forward two years from now. I'm going to say this so all of you understand what's about to happen. When all the fertile land burns, when there's drought, when um, there's extreme heat, the animals, for example, our farming animals, our chickens, our cows, our goats, you know, etc. Those animals don't produce as much. Okay, They're, it messes with their mating patterns, reproducing. It messes with their own body, uh, bodily functions because they're not eating the, the same lush grass. They're not drinking as much water, so now they're not producing as much milk. And we may not be feeling this right this second. But believe me, by next year, you're going to hear all the same excuses because you heard it the other day. You heard it not too long ago when there was extreme drought and then extreme flooding that, oh my gosh, you know, uh, we're feeling the effects from last year. It's going to come. So just expect now for meat, all of you out there that shop in the markets and so on, just expect meat price to go because all the farmers are going to say soon that um, because of what happened last year and the drought that lasted a year last year and hopefully ends soon, you know, as, or is continuing, meat has gone up because the animals are not producing as much. 
And then you're going to hear that the farmers are going to say, well, we didn't get a good crop because the, uh, the, the, the farmland didn't produce as much as it could because of the drought. I don't need to spell this out for you guys, but we're in trouble here. It's coming, and it's coming like, like, like a ton of bricks, okay? The planet is dying. And what that BBC journalist was alluding to was that at this point in time, believe it or not, I think we should be sitting down here stating that we are trying to control how much oil we are producing. But because of that, countries like England and France and so on need to pay us to keep that oil in the ground. Okay? Not trying to bring it up as quickly as possible. That's not the right thing to do. We need to be fighting an entirely different battle here to look at those countries and say, here, guys, if what you're saying is as important as it is, then you need to pay us to keep that oil in the ground. Okay? That's what the fight needs to be now. Because, guys, we are in trouble here. Now, everyone wants to scream as well that Guyana needs the money. I'm going to be the first to say, again, in my pessimistic way, that Guyana has never been a poor country, okay? Right now we're earning in and around $10 million a day, 10, about 10 million US a day, all right? At 10 million US dollars a day for less than a million people, I can't tell you that we have more than enough money already, all right? We are already making enough. If, if we don't put one more rig out there, if we put zero oil producing rigs, um, to add add zero rigs to what's going on out there right now already, we will still be making enough money because the oil isn't going anywhere. I think we'll also figure out how to handle it in a sustainable manner. We'll also figure out how to build it, um, to, to, to manage our money in a sustainable manner, also manage our environment in a sustainable manner. All right? It has nothing to do... I, I heard Irfan screaming about zero, um, net zero, right? And that has to do with our carbon emissions because we have the jungle. And although that's great and dandy, it doesn't mean that we're not contributing to global warming in a major way. We are, one of, we are going to be one of the largest oil producing nations in the world that's very soon, all right? And the fact of the matter is we are going to be contributing very heavily to the, 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 the carbon emissions. So even though we have a jungle, even though that, that, that we are, we are you know, trying to create our own balance and as a country have its own balance as far as carbon uh, emissions goes. The truth of the matter is we are still contributing to global warming. We are not solving the problem. So instead of us looking at just ourselves, we have to realize very quickly that we're running into trouble here. And Guyana is going to be one of the first to feel global warming, as we are already. Now, I know that this is not what people want to hear, but... I'm sorry, Guyana, like I said, has never been a poor country. And the money that we're making already is more than enough. All right? I'm not saying stop producing oil. I'm not saying that. No one is saying that. But we have to be able to manage it. And one of the ways that I have an issue, one of the, one of the things I have an issue with, is the fact that, again, I spoke on earlier about en production of energy. Why are we building a natural gas power plant, a gas to energy power plant, when we have um, enough facilities, enough resources that we can do hydro, um, hydro, uh, wind and solar. Now, I don't get it. If we are claiming that we are doing our part as an oil producing nation to save the planet, then why are we about to open a brand new, huge fossil fuel burning um, natural gas power plant? That doesn't make any sense. Why have we not gone? Why have we not taken that 2 billion US dollars and put it straight into renewable energy? What's, what do you mean? Uh, the stupidness about it is that the government uh, kept spewing when they were planning to build this thing. Oh, natural, um, renewable energy is not, is not um, what's the word they used? Is, uh, is not advanced enough, is not far enough. And what are you talking about? The rest of the world is doing it already. So many countries. You, you, have, you have Costa Rica, India. India's on their way to be almost fully renewable. Germany. Germany is what, like 80% now on renewables? What are you guys talking about? And Germany's one of, and Germany and India are some of the largest manufacturing countries in the world. So stop lying. The, the, we are very capable. Of, of, 
of going straight to renewables. And and this this whole thing is just we talk about who cares about the planet and who cares about people. I went to rodeo. I went to Let Them Rodeo and it was great. It was an amazing time. I've been many, many times and I love it every single time. Um I, you know, I spent quite I spent about two or three days in Brazil as well in Movista. And you know, it was great. And um I thought I would say it because I didn't see it 720 already. I thought I should say it. You know what really broke my heart? The amount of children and people that were begging, like poor, poor people begging at the rodeo. It was 10 times more than ever before. All right. And there were so many poor people there. You, you, you're driving into rodeo and you see the little children sleeping at the side of the road. It was heartbreaking. Little, little children, mothers, with, 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 these babies can't be more than two weeks old and walking around with them trying to sell whatever little thing they're selling. And you sat down and you went, Jesus, this is not progress. You know, I, I took a deeper look and a lot of the people that were begging were, 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 um, were Venezuelans that came over. And it was a very interesting dynamic of who they were because they weren't real Venezuelans in the context that they had Venezuelan passports. They were like Venezuelan natives, like Venezuelan Amerindians. And because of that, they were kind of in this weird no man's land, right? Like they were not like citizens of anywhere, right? Because you look at them and you, you, you think it's our local Amerindians. And some of them are, but some of them are not. I'll even go with saying majority of them are not. And, you know, we sat down, I sat down and I went, I had this conversation lots over and over. And I, you know, they were like, I said, you know, they need to do more to help these people. Because I crossed the border, I went over to Movista. And what was amazing about Movista is that they had set up this humongous, like, um, this humongous, like, tent city. Where they have these big military tents set up with flowing water, bathrooms, and so on. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's not luxury. But it's at least shelter and, and running water and electricity that they have, they've moved all the Venezuelans into, all the Venezuelans that were on the street. Because I was there a couple of years back, and there were lots of Venezuelans on the road. And they've moved them all. The government spent this money, because these are not tax-paying citizens, spent this money to move these Venezuelans into at least an environment that the children can be comfortable in. At least they can sleep, at least they're secure, you know, etc., and have the amenities. Now I sat down and I looked looked around let them and all these poor people and all these poor Amerindians begging and poor Venezuelans begging I'm like Jesus this is heartbreaking and you know I looked at a couple of people and I said you know this is so sad and they're like yeah but you know um some of them are Venezuelans and we can't help them or or does not we problem and I and it goes right back to the I guess the theme of this conversation is that what do you mean you can't help them like, is the, do we care about no one except ourselves? Like, like, we only consider, like, we only consider helping people if it's convenient to us. Like these, like, these people need help. These are children. I don't care where they're from. They have to be helped. They, these, are, these are people. We have no compassion, no empathy anymore. We've lost it in this country. This... It, I, I, drew, I came back, and I, it's so funny because I came back and I drove, uh, you know, I, it was on a Sunday, I think I came back, I came back Easter Sunday or Monday, I think, because it was a holiday. And then I drove down Regent Street and I got to like Orange Walk area and you should see how many homeless people are out there lining that road. And then I passed by Burnham Court. You should see how many poor people, you should see how many homeless people. And then I rode, drove down Rob Street and I'm like, oh God, this is sickening. Oil rich Guyana, people poor and living on the road in Latin, people poor and living on the road in Georgetown. Y'all don't got no empathy for nobody, y'all don't care. All this money making, I see a man driving a, I see a man driving a brand new Rolls Royce truck next to poor people begging, hey, please, or something. And we talking about progress. Y'all are despicable to still be here and accepting that. I, 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 I look down on you, everyone, for not trying to do more. Right? And I don't, you know what? I don't even expect you to go out there and do anything. I don't expect you because I know you ain't got the money to do it. You all, y'all sitting on here say, what you want me to do? Partner, talk to your government. They're making 10 million US a day. Let them do more for people, partner. Stop being so selfish. Stop closing your eyes and pretending like everything is great. It's not. 
something is wrong. Then you talk about jobs coming into the country, well, with this big new hotel that some Qatari and, and government joint venture is building on, on Carifesta Avenue. And you're like, oh, look, big hotel means progress. Why? Because a whole bunch of Guyanese can get jobs and they're walking, well, to cleaning people's room and, and, and cooking people food and bartending for people. That's what progress is. That's, that's big jobs we're talking about. That's where the money there. As, as I go right back to Tim. How come Guyanese can't stay in that hotel? How, how much Guyanese y'all think can stay in Marriott? How much guy needs y'all think to stay in Pegasus? Y'all think that's progress that none of we can't afford to stay in them hotels? That's what that's what progress to y'all is. Y'all are so blind that y'all suffering sitting down there. Can't afford nothing but still screaming progress. Where well, you can wait for your turn. Give me a break. I over it. I, 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 I'm sickened by people that sit down here still and pretend like everything is great. On that note, let me not continue this uh this 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 live. And and I hope that. All of you out there will somewhat open your eyes, somewhat realize what's going on in this country, somewhat realize that the arrogance of this government pretending like everything is great and y'all listening to it like, 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 like if it's gospel, yet you suffering yourself, get over it. I hope to see people, I hope to see more. And you know what? All of you out there, I am not seeing the messages, but all of you out there that are screaming, Rome wasn't built in a day. Well, guess what? Guyana was never a poor country. Okay? We've always had gold. Bauxite, sugar, diamond, sand, timber, stone, and the list goes on and on and on and on. We've always been extremely rich. And again, we're less than a million people. So you ask me how long this Rome needs to take to build, okay, before the people of the country have a better life. Because the billions of dollars in contracts to build roads, I'm sorry, but if you think that's what is going to make everyone's lives better, roads, then you're really missing at least 50% of the picture. Because at the end of it, when we have the roads, and the people can't access, um, you know, better quality items, or the people have not been more educated, and the people's lives have not upgraded. I'm sorry. Traffic, a new road, traffic is not what solves the country's problems. All right. On that note, guys, I will be back here next Friday, I promise, and I am going to be on a much more positive note. I have a much more positive show for you because I'm going to be talking a lot more about solutions. All right, I'm going to get a little bit political next week. All right, so thank you guys for joining me here. Please be a little bit more empathetic to people. Please, please understand that there are people out there suffering. Take a drive around, step out of Georgetown, even in Georgetown, and take a look around and see that there are people out there that are suffering too many, way too many for big, oil-rich producing Guyana. Something is wrong. On that note, guys, thank you for joining me on Apolitically Incorrect Guyana. My name is Kian Jabur, and I will be back here next Friday. Be safe out there this weekend. Take care.